begin, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and that it is a privilege to share stories and to share art on this land, and that it's land that is it's never been ceded, and it's always was, always will be Aboriginal land, and we're very lucky to be here. And we're very lucky to be here with the wonderful Candy Bowers. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, about your work? Yeah. Sure. Uh, look, I do a few things and they're all in the creative sphere. So I'm a multi-hyphenate. My identity is always enmeshed in the things I do. As a playwright, um, I've mainly written lyrical theatre, so hip-hop and spoken word theatre. Uh, my last work on The Bear was for young people and was written about in a fancy American peer-reviewed paper about um, breakthrough decolonizing work for young people. So whatever genre or space I'm in, I often find myself winning or being spoken about as innovative or breakthrough or genre busting. But I also think when I look around, there's not many people like me in those spaces. So I'm like, is the innovation that I'm black and a woman and queer? Maybe that's the innovation. Um, because I feel like uh, I'm not sure if, it, if it's something that folks think, but I've heard it a few times, that there's a sense like I'm going out there to be radical or to do something edgy. And for me, it's just actually like um, an extension of who I am. And perhaps it's not about me doing those things, but it's about the fact that the industry is a monoculture. Yeah. And what I make and the art I make um, doesn't currently fit in like I don't. You know, so it's a really interesting thing because I think when perhaps people of color make work that does fit into those structures, there's a sense that, um, uh, you know, that that's that's what art is, or that's that's what it is, and and I've never felt like I had to um, do that. <laughs> So uh, I think what I do is just kind of what I want to do and then convince, do a lot of convincing and persuading of structures to let me in so I can disrupt them and bend them and break them. Yeah. So I talk about that because I think it's embedded in how I make work and, and why I make work. Uh, my parents are political refugees from apartheid South Africa. So that really political history has always led me to making bigger plays or works or telling stories that live on a um, sort of matrilineal fault line around freedom and around identity and people being um, treated certain ways because of those. I also uh, run art for decolonization workshops and try to teach an impact on all different sorts of people. So I've done it in yo for yoga classes or yoga teacher training mm -hmm. and all the way to, you know, music theatre at the VCA or to directors during Melbourne Festival. So sort of I feel like I make and work in a space that I'm trying to just resource open platforms and build possibilities, new philosophies, higher consciousness in order to get to that human connectivity that I think art is sort of made for. Yeah, definitely. Mm. What is, you touched on it briefly, what is your creative process considering you, like you said, you've got your fingers in many pies. What, is it the same creative process no matter what you're creating or does it vary? I think because I've come from a real theatre nerd background and that just sort of locked into me so young that my craft is theatre and European for that reason because we didn't in my era get to study other sorts of um, work so that curiosity is only starting to build in me in the last sort of 10 years of my of how I make and things so mm -hmm. I had to get curious to find out well what's the canon what's the um, African-American choreo poet canon what's you know what's a South Asian or Indian form of creating theatre uh, you know, if we were dancers, we would have learned world dance in our, mm. in our universities and things. But I went to NIDA. It was a really white supremacist, um, patriarchal structure where the white male playwright was 
up the top and everybody else came next. So, you know, I do love Shakespeare and I do love Greek theatre and all those sort, sorts of things. I can't deny that. I know a lot of people hate it. <laughs> but structurally, what's going on, pulling it apart, finding the queerness in it, finding all that, I've done all that. But I also really explode and uh, my real sort of teachers are Toni Morrison and Audre Lorde and Maya Angelou and Lebo Chile in South Africa and, um, you know, Kath Walker, Udru, Nunukul here. So those things I've had to be curious about and get, you know, reach out beyond, outreach beyond how I was brought up and the education systems I was brought up in. But I do find myself really understanding them in order to pull them apart. I think if anybody said, what's your key craft, I would say poetry. Yeah in the way we think of playwrights as poets as well Mm. and then from that my favorite thing to do with that is satire so I feel if I can find even any time actually I think about this a lot I'm an intellect but also a total goof so say when things really terrifying things are happening around the world that's when I started watching TikTok you know, the way I got through the whole American shambles that it was, was, you know, seeing this Mexican kid and his dad lip sync news reports <laughs> of the capital being taken over. And I was like, I can handle the news now. Mm. So I think that that's also my role as a mischief maker is to flip things around. So to, I love working in allegory. And in parallel space, like a lot of black and queer artists do, the kind of parallel universe of the sci-fi, that's that's a space I work in a lot rather than showing people directly. And I think that's cause and effect because uh, I find it almost impossible to get to that higher consciousness or get people to think differently or shift their social mores or their socialization directly. You know, Mm. Um, I feel like using using uh, allegory and comedy, that's that's the lubricant. That's that's what shifts the plates. Um, It's naturally what I have always loved doing, too. And I don't deny that's probably because I was always a different kid in the space. So to disarm people, um, if you're too impressive, like, say, academically impressive, that can be bad. Yeah. in an Australian context yeah. so and even today like I'll, I'll say to my friends you can't win because I'm very smart but I'm also a dum-dum so <laughs> as soon as you think that you've got me on an intellectual thing I'm going to make a fart joke and the foundation of everything is going to fall away mm-hmm. so that's why I, I probably um, you know have self-named the radical mischief maker because I feel like it's rarely afforded to black women to be funny and satirical yeah. we like even i was working a little bit on tonightly and i had to keep saying to the writers no no, no i'm i'm the funny one because <laughs> they want to pair me with white boys or whoever and they they want them to be funny and me to be the straight person because they're used to that they think it's they can pick fun at that the the staunch angry you know black woman and the goofball white guy you know so i'm sort of going no no Uh, you can be all those things you can be everything and it's it's interesting how (laughs) that can really make people feel uh, confused or insecure when I think why are you streamlining yourself into this bottleneck it's like you've drank the water Mm -hmm. you know we are all so many things and and I think because the privilege of my position of having been minoritized so strongly across all of my identities is that I can chuck away all of the systems too. Yeah. Whereas I think my friends who are closer to passing or to being, you know, straight white guys, whatever, I'm like, mm, you're, you're the one that needs your community to come, you know, you all need work because you're playing the game harder than anyone else because the game was built for you to feel like you were winning. Mm. But are you? Yeah. 
you know? As a multidisciplinary artist, how do you balance the creative work and the producing and business side of your job? Right on! <laughs> yeah. I mean, for parts of my life, I'm working 10 to 12 hour days. Mm. Yeah. Uh, balance is not a word I use a lot. It doesn't feel like a balance. It just feels like having to do everything at once. And I'm really craving to cut away and cut back and to rest upon the foundations of that crazy work that I'd been doing, you know, for the last sort of 20 years of my career. So I feel like hopefully in the near future, I will be able to decide now to streamline Yeah. Um, because you can't do everything well and you need teams and you need support. So more for me is like building strategy and uh, ensuring that you have what you need to move forward. You know, it's like mm -hmm. setting out to climb a mountain without a sandwich or a backpack, yes. you know, yeah, definitely. or try to make a cake without milk. You're like, this doesn't seem to. And of course <laughs> you cook it. It's like not a cake, is it? No. So, you know, I feel like the arts are just such a danger zone and a minefield to, I think that what it, what it's um, doing and what we all do is it's like feeding on our vulnerabilities because every time I step into teaching a class, whether it be primary school kids or high school kids or at the VCA or wherever, when a group of adults in their fifties and sixties, whether it's poetry or hip hop theater or art for decolonization workshops, what I meet is a group of really open-hearted people. Yeah. You know, really um, like emotionally aware, like really emotionally big-hearted people. Now that is our industry, right? It's very easy to take advantage of people who are so open-hearted. And I feel like that's happened to me on a number of occasions. So rather than balance, I think I'm learning how to compartmentalize a bit more and put on my business, you know, boss lady pants. Yeah. Uh, even though that has been, I'm the opposite of what the, um, you know, the socialization has been like, no, you care for people, you collaborate, you this and that. And I started going, you know what? I don't really like that. That doesn't work within what I want to do or achieve. I, I need to be an authority and I need to run the game and I need to run the room. So that's been, it's more like, I know the question, but it's sort of more like, um, learning ways to really step into that power mm -hmm. and to, you know, use... Because there was this period of time, it was before I went away to, the, to America a few years back, where I just thought I didn't have a network. Like, I just kept thinking, and artists do this. I hear it all the time. We can't do that. We don't have that. We don't have that. We don't have that. And it's like we've told ourselves we don't have what it takes. Or I'm an artist. I don't think like that. Or, you know, but I think, mm, just tilt slightly and understand your creativity, your ability to collaborate, your ability to plan, um, to connect emotion to word, to um, stand in other people's shoes, all of those skills, they're all skills mm. that you can use in other places as well. Yeah. But you have to just get off the, I don't know what you call that, like, um, sort of silly things artists tell themselves or that the industry have told you to kind of keep you down yeah. keep you in your place right yeah and so i'm just um for me having been around for as long as i've been around uh the industry it's now learning how to connect and partner with the right folks get the right support um all that sort of thing you know because that's what really producing truly is Yes. Not always getting your hands dirty, doing all the work, but working out how to delegate, how to find the right person for those jobs. Yeah. That sort of thing. Mm. Awesome. So your work evokes a lot of vulnerability from yourself and also from your audience. Mm. How, and we talk about this a lot with spoken word poetry because it can be so raw. How do you keep yourself safe and how do you keep your audience safe? Is that something that you even think about? Mm. Yeah. I do think about it. Um, beautiful artist who made salt uh, came out, black British artist, and she talked about how um, audiences, she, she goes out to ensure she doesn't hurt her or harm mm. her community with what she does. Yeah. And she does similar 
work. I thought about that a lot. And, and what I think is interesting is when you privilege yourself, your child self, your elder self, therefore privileging, you know, the intergeneration of your community, that can feel hard for certain other folks, right? That can feel like a lot of people have told me they felt attacked or they felt not included. Mm. A lot of people tell me that, and sometimes I'm very shocked at the people who tell me they feel included because I was like, you're the last person I was thinking about. <laughs> That's nice to know. But I think that when you, for me, it's more like there's something that really calls me to share something. Uh, and it's like, I remember having a fight with one of my sisters who's married to a white guy and we don't get along that well. I don't get along with him that well. And I was talking just, you know, it was more like Twitter and stuff like that, not, not art, but it's always in there in my art too. She was saying, you know, white people aren't going to listen to you. These people that are racist aren't going to change. And I went, ah, you think I'm doing it for them? When I speak up and speak out and do these things, what I get is inundated by other women of colour who say thank you for speaking the things that I haven't been able to say out loud yet or thank you for articulating that. Thank you for giving that a name. Thank you for being there. Thank you for being brave. So I, I'm not waiting for, like, you know, the Joes of the world to, like, inbox me. <laughs> And then I went, ah, why would you think that I was doing that? And then it's reflected on the people that are talking to you because they want to get that gold star. They are working tirelessly to be accepted, right? So I'm not doing that. No. Which is confronting for everybody. And probably the other thing, it is confronting for other people of colour who um, are more assimilated than me right i think everybody's assimilated i think we can't get away from that i think we're all dealing with internalized racism and misogyny and homophobia and it's like the self-assessment part of cultural safety is really important i can't uh know or control what other people will go through i'm always being called brave like at a board meeting all the way through to on stage and it's really interesting it kind of reminds me of like I was in doing my show on the bear at the opera house. And so, you know, I just put all my sportwear on or whatever. And then I might go and grab something from the shop. And then there might be a dress shop. And I'll say, oh, look, and then I'll keep going. And I was wearing this really great, amazing, coordinated, like, crop and, like, leggings that my friend Nisha designs. Mm -hmm. And they're really amazing. And I was just walking around and doing my thing, not thinking too much that I was, like, right in the middle of Sydney, like, on George Street, where I think people, there's not, not a lot of people that look like me or would wear that. And this woman just like touched my arm, older white woman, and she said, you're so brave, right? And I said, looked at her and I said, mm. you know, this is while I'm doing my breakthrough work for young people at the <laughs> Opera House, right, that barely ever have um, people from the African diaspora, from Australia on their stages, all this. And I said, I am brave, but not because I'm wearing this coordinated <laughs> set. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's sort of interesting. Um, you are, you have to, you have to come back and be accountable to yourself and work out that every time uh, and know whether you're doing what you're doing. Like, I, I feel like I've had really strong sections of my life. I think when I first came out, I wanted to educate white people. That's mm -hmm. what I wanted. I wanted white people to understand white Australia to understand what people of colour go through, what someone like me would go through, what like a queer fat black woman would go through, right? And even today, like I call myself fat, it's really interesting and people are like, you're not fat, this is fat, right? So then you're like, um, it's so fantastically wonderful to constantly be working out. And for someone who looks like me, I get coded differently everywhere I go in the world. You know, and when I was in the States right now, I was like, oh, thick and natural and, and light-skinned is in. And I'm like, oh, the light-skinned part makes me feel very uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Mm. So I'm I'm in a really interesting vantage point to having, like, flicking between countries and spaces of being minoritized and then being the hottest thing. And then, so I've experienced so many of those things that I can kind of screw it up and chuck it out the window. Mm. Like, none of it's real. Right? Okay. So when people, you know, very deeply when people 
don't feel black enough or don't feel beautiful enough or you know feel too black or uh, are embarrassed for being you know too um, objectified all that I feel like I've had all of those experiences personally and most people kind of kind of get to stick in a lane yeah um, but that's why I do I'm, I'm really trying to build space for people that experience multiple experiences so we can also feel like we're not crazy and allow for the, all of that fluidity as well like not just going I know what this is mm. and I know what that is and that's where you stop and that's where you start like maybe maybe not you know and and so when folks are like <laughs> I remember a woman when we first did hot brown honey at Woodford Festival white woman coming up to me and says your show you know I feel attacked by your show and I said oh okay fair we never made it to thinking about that we made it thinking about each other and I said, and where did you see it? Because we'd done it at the First Nations tent, and then we'd done it in, you know, Woodford. You do a lot of different places. She goes, well, I've seen it everywhere. And I went, oh. And she goes, I went to every show. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so you hate it, but, but you love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's on you, babe. Right? And I was like, well, this is not I think we might have a hit on our hands. Like, yeah. So, so what I've also been able to do is enjoy and... When people say this can't be done, I'm like, maybe you can. That's what's kept me going. Mm. As somebody who's very good at a lot of things, excellent even, mm. what is something that you're not necessarily good at that you enjoy doing? Oh, that I enjoy doing? Mm. Yes. Oh, what am I not good at that I enjoy doing? <laughs> um, 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 um. I mean. Oh. Okay, this is a great question. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait till we get to I think the that, I, think, I think that there's heaps of things I'm not good at, but I'm like, I, I mean, I'm messy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fuck that. Messy is awful. <laughs> when I'm like in a hotel room or somewhere else, I've only got a few things that I can keep it really neat and I can write. And then I'm at home and I'm like, oh, I can't keep this shit together, right? <laughs> because I've always just been creative. Mm. I've always put creativity first. You can't get to where I've gotten to if you've got a house and kids in it. Like, I, you can't. Yeah. Because I've seen my friends and I'm like, ah, ah, oh, you know, and they're like voyeuristically living through me. I'm voyeuristically living through their very nice clean house. <laughs> like... So I think that that's one thing, because I, when I do shows and stuff, like my dressing rooms and stuff, I try to keep that really immaculate and so I can work in that space. But yeah, I hate being messy. That's definitely one. Yeah. Usually we ask our guest a series of really funny, whimsical questions. Mm -hmm. They're this or that questions, and we just want you to answer the first thing that pops into your okay. mind. Gotcha. Okay, so talking or texting? Talking. The last song that you listened to? Uh, Jerome Lizzo. Invisibility or super strength? <laughs> <laughs> Invisibility. Uh, your favourite ice cream flavour? Peppermint chocolate chip. Mm. Dawn or dusk? Dusk. Uh, if you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? I'd go to the future because the history for black women wasn't good. Paper or e-device? Paper. Do you have a party trick? Oh my god, I can I can sing some songs very well that people are shocked by. What what are the songs? Like Porter's Head or um, Seer and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, does pineapple belong on pizza? Belong is an interesting <laughs> word. No, I do love a Hawaiian. What is your favourite word? Mm, elucidate. Mm -hmm. What TV show are you currently watching? Oh my god, I'm currently watching Younger, which is embarrassing because it's so trash and so many white people. But I've just watched everything in the last little bit anyway. How to Get Away with Murder, mm -hmm. Younger, um, fucking that other, The One, mm -hmm. I've also been watching. Yeah. Oh, Zoe's. I've watched them all. Zoe's too is much. Yes, yeah. very good. That's, yes. Uh, what did you want to be when you were younger? Ah, I wanted to be a musical theatre star. Yeah. And finally, one piece of advice that you'd like to give to your either younger self or aspiring poets. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Write about everything. 
don't leave it out who you are why did you write that poem why is that you the best person to write that poem why are you the only person that could write that poem that's good advice mm. so thank you for joining us it's been <laughs> the slam of a ding dong team yes candy bowers who you can catch the last sunday of this month thank you At so much yes yeah awesome yeah great thank, thank you, you.